Hey everybody, how's it going? So, if you watch any of my older videos, you probably get the idea that I'm not the biggest fan of franchises in the repair industry. I think that it's best if you start your own repair business, even if you're small, even if you don't have a brand name, build your own brand name rather than pay to utilize someone else's. Because most of the innovation that I notice occurring in our industry, most of the people coming up with new methods or finding new tools or new ways to work on new devices or figuring out new fixes for the new devices are the Jessa Joneses, the Chris Longs, the Michael Oberdicks, the Tim Hermans, the you know Mark Schaefers, you know, the independents, not the you break, I fix, the CPR, the I fix and repairs and all that. I think that the story that I'm about to tell you is really telling in terms of how knowledgeable your average franchise is versus in normal independent repair shops that are not run by big name franchises. Two years ago, I started to get much busier after that CBC News piece came out. The business had been kind of increasing for years since then, and that was the catalyst for that little parabolic expansion to start happening after that CBC News piece came out on us. And we're at the point now where on a day that's not that busy, in eight hours we'll get over 2,000 phone calls. There'll be uh, 77 new inquiries uh, via email, not even 77 like emails, I mean 77 inquiries where they'll have several emails back and forth. That's not including customers that are already existing. That'll be another few hundred emails back and forth. So we're finally at a point where it may make sense to set up a way to deal with customers where we can have the same general standard of how we deal with them, but it make it a little bit easier to onboard more people. So I was checking out companies like this, like Simpler. Simpler is one of those companies where you're supposed to be able to outsource customer service. It's done in America. You pay a little more, but all the customer service agents are in the US, it seems. And they also use AI and some machine learning thing to try and help you, the, the agents give better responses. So what I've done to try to make it easier. So I have this knowledge base thing. Uh, it used to be in Freshdesk. Now it's in Zendesk. And you can kind of see how it's set up here. Like if it's not charging, you know, I give you the idea of what it is. Uh, if the machine's dead or there's no power, it kind of gives you an idea here for every year and model, what it could be, uh, it, so that you have an idea of what to tell the customer. It has a suggested canned response. All my canned responses go over everything in great detail. Uh, so it really does kind of make it so that someone who literally starts started working here yesterday could speak to a customer then and sound like they know what they're talking about but also kind of have an idea what to do in the machine these guides are also getting updated with you know the a little flow kind of diagram on how to start troubleshooting basic issues on the bottom this part is just pretty much if someone says this is their problem what can i tell the customer regarding price ranges right because if you tell a customer we need to see it a lot of the times they will just run away and think you're incompetent. But if you say, we need to see it, but here's what it could be, then they they have the confidence necessary to leave something with you. So I thought we're maybe, maybe finally at a point where you can consider it. So I reached out to these people at this company called Simpler, and they said, well, you know, we, we don't support Freshdesk. We may in the future. We support Zendesk right now, and I used Freshdesk. A year and a half later, I reached out to them again, and they said, we're not looking to support Freshdesk, but we do support Zendesk. So I migrated over to Zendesk and I had over 45,000 tickets, a ton of macros, canned responses, agent stuff, knowledge base articles out the wazoo. So doing a manual migration or using one of those PHP tools where it'll like randomly crash in the middle of it and not copy everything over wasn't really an option for me. I had to use one of those paid migration things and those can be over a thousand dollars. So I spoke, I reached out to Simpler and they said, okay, you know, here's the numbers that we're looking for. Here's what we think we can do for you. I migrate over to Zendesk. I pay out the ass for it. I spend a day or two tweaking and setting up everything. I speak to them and then I get an email from them a few days later. Our ops team finished the analysis of your Zendesk account and unfortunately it doesn't look like we be able to have a significant impact. The number that we'd be able to do is fairly low, less than 50. I apologize. We can't be of more help. Uh, so I kind of inquired as to why, because it sounded like you know, this, this would have uh, been synergistic. And they said, our platform and network works best when ticket types are repeatable and common. Unfortunately, a great many of the tickets you receive are different, and they are often detailed questions. Keep that in mind, detailed questions. Our typical partner is seeing 200 plus a day. Our analysis showed 77, and we'd only be able to take a small portion of those. And again, the reason being, 
being is that they, as they say, they are often detailed questions. So at the moment, I kind of said, okay, whatever, screw it, you know, lesson learned. Granted, it would have been nice if they could have logged into my Freshdesk account prior to me spending over $1,000 in several days of time migrating everything over to an entirely different platform that I can't undo, but I'm not salty. But then I took a second look at Simpler's website and I saw here it said an Asurian company. And that kind of rang a bell. Asurian is an insurance company that deals with millions and millions and millions of repairs uh, for all sorts of companies, from Verizon, uh, all, everybody. They deal with insane volumes of repair, and I imagine customer service for it. And recently, they also bought a company called You Break I Fix, which is a franchise repair shop that does repair. In my, you know, it, it's kind of hit or miss. When I look online and I see the salaries that they're paying people, it's not really surprising to me as to why it's kind of hit or miss with them because if you really, really knew if you had to, had to do these jobs very well, you, you, you wouldn't want to work for the salaries that, that they're offering. But what I found particularly interesting here, and this is just what, what kind of made me laugh when I did this video, is the company that says the questions that your customers have are too detailed. Even if you have a guide, even if you have this little bold printed, here are all your canned responses for every single problem on every single model and everything is perfectly written out, even with our machine learning process, your questions are just too complicated for our professional customer service company is that that company is literally owned by one of the largest repair companies in the United States that's been gobbling up repair shops left and right. And this is why when I say things like, just, just beware the franchises, beware the, the large names where there's the beautiful, pretty website, beautiful website, beautiful store, beautiful brand name. One of the messages I've had over the past seven years in this channel is you're not always getting the the best technician when you go to places that have the beautiful branding and all of that. And this just, this just made me laugh hysterically. Erica actually asked a question of them regarding pricing. And what I found particularly funny is they were not able to give any idea of pricing at all. So for, for, for us, let's say that you ask a question regarding liquid damage and you don't give us a model, we actually have a canned response that is particularly set up for that purpose. You don't know what year of model you have, because let's face it, a lot of Mac users often don't know what they own, but we actually had that here and they don't, which they were not able to respond with any sort of basic price range as to what it could cost, whereas here is what we have set up, because again, this is, this is just not that hard if you're trying. You know, it gives you an idea of general price ranges for the general things that wind up breaking. It gives you an idea of how we work, how to bring it here, and so on and so forth. And I don't know, I'm just, I'm kind of repeating myself at this point. But a part of me was really, really laughing inside to see that a that one of the largest franchise repair companies in America owns a customer service company that cannot pro provide basic customer service for a repair company because the questions are too complicated. Just wrap your head around that a little bit when you're thinking about the quality of the franchises that exist in the repair industry. Just like, just like think about that, sit on that for a little bit, because it, it really does speak volumes uh, that more than anything that I could say to criticize franchises within the independent repair industry. This really does tie in with some stuff that I've been talking about recently. Jessa did a video about a customer that came to her shop that was quoted up to like $900, or more potentially for what was literally just a screen issue to recover data. And the only problem the person had was a bad screen. And it came from a company called Drive Savers. I have myself had customers bring us drives that needed nothing but an enclosure and they were quoted over a thousand dollars nothing but a charge port was needed were quoted over a thousand dollars for their data and a lot of the comments that showed up were well you're not supposed to bring something that just needs that to them they're only for the most difficult cases for the worst destroyed rate arrays for the drives that have been through fires that's what they're for and I, th those comments themselves showed me that marketing Kool-Aid in 28, even 2020, still works. There are several phones that have been to drive savers. They weren't able to recover them, and then Jessa recovered them live on stream and showed everybody what she did. Even though, you know, but there's still this Kool-Aid idea that, you know, that you, you need the big branded company. And this came up recently in this video, which was particularly aggravating to Jessa. I understand why, since 
she, for about a good four or five years, was staying up until two or four in the morning at the expense of having a life just trying to figure out the flaws in a lot of these phones, sometimes spending upwards of 70 to 100 hours in a single case and then failing and then having that feeling of failure that comes from banging your head against the wall for 90 hours on a single device trying to figure something out. But the thing that happens when you do that is eventually you come up with the, you finally find these little solutions that no one else has. And she really enjoys sharing these solutions with the world. Like when she figured out last year how there was this issue with a speaker IC that was causing boot looping. And she went over that in this video. It's this long and you're in a hurry. I'm going to tell you the solution is removing or deactivating the relatively small speaker amp chip. So you could imagine that when she text messaged someone at DriveSavers that didn't know about this solution that was probably no fixing phones that had this problem up until this point, she was rather aggravated when she wound up hearing this part. An example of this one was a weird update in the fall of 2019 where particularly the 7 Plus would get stuck on the Apple logo, which on the surface smells like a logical problem. But then after seeing a bunch of them, DriveSavers figured out that there was a physical fix by shorting the speaker IC. The fuck they did. They're marketing and to be 100% clear, I don't hold Linus accountable or responsible for the fact that he did not know before doing this video that drive savers are marketing They're not actually coming up with these solutions. They don't have them. They take them from the community. Jessa in her video actually credited the people that helped her come to the conclusion that this was the issue before sharing it with everyone. But like, oh, there's this idea that the large brand name companies, the ones that have all the marketing money, have all the advertising money, are the ones that make the industry what it is. And they're not. They're really not. The companies that make this industry what, what it is are the Tim Hermans, are the Michael Oberdicks in Ohio, are the, the, the Mark Schaefer's, the Chris Long's, the Jessa Jones's, the, you know, the, the, the people that will spend until three or four in the morning every single day staring into their microscope because they enjoy what they do and they enjoy solving problems and they enjoy then sharing what they learned with the world. And the thing is, most of those places probably don't have the prettiest of websites because they didn't have time to work on their website because they were too busy coming up with the solutions that everybody else winds up uh, using or in the case of this company saying, I'm sorry, we're just, your tickets are too complicated to be, even be able to answer your questions. <laughs> in spite of the fact that we're owned by America's largest repair company. Oh, man, that, that just hit me like a ton of bricks. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video.